Hello, this is Pastor Mark. Yes, this, I'll say right off the top, it feels very weird. Uh, but hey, this is our current new reality for, for a time being. And uh, worshiping, uh, leading worship in the midst of an empty sanctuary. Uh, but for all of you to be able to worship God as well together. So we come together virtually to worship Almighty God. The psalmist reminds us, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who has made us. We are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. So enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. For the Lord is good and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues throughout all generations. And we will sing to God's praise and God's glory, Hosanna. Do we have any other announcements? 
<laughs> no, there are no more other announcements. So then let's go to the Lenten liturgy. God calls the servant Christ to sustain the weary, the ones in exile, the ones in despair, the ones who are afraid. Jesus enters the city in humility, lauded by the crowds, Hosanna, save us, questioned by the powers that be, betrayed and denied by his friends. We watch with unease and bewilderment, complicit with the fickle crowd, misunderstanding the true power, frightened and looking to our own interests. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. Creator God, we give thanks to you, for you are good. Your steadfast love endures forever. We seek courage for the living of these days. Let the same mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus, so that we may give ourselves in love and humility to further your purpose of life for the world. So may all people come to know the height and depth of your redeeming love through Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Lord. Amen. And we extinguish a candle each week in this season of Lent as a symbolic way of remembering and understanding that Jesus' life ended, was extinguished. He willingly gave it up on the cross on our behalf. And we sing to God's praise, Hosanna to the living Lord. The Lord is God, 
and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand to join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And the New Testament reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at the doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They entered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David! Hosanna in the highest heaven! Jesus entered Jerusalem, went into the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word of life and hope and love and truth for our daily living. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, these are different times, and yet together, online, we seek to worship you. For you are, are worthy of being worshipped all the time, wherever we are. So, Lord, we pray that you would touch each person's heart who would gather together to worship you. In the comfort of their home and the safety of home, bless them, Lord, with your presence, your peace. And may you speak to each one of us your truth. Enable us by your spirit to grow in your love. To grow in ways that would honor you. That we would be your hands and your feet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Is there any pain that stays with us longer than that of not being wanted? The pain of being rejected. This rejection comes from family, friends, colleagues, classmates, and even from society as a whole. An older man was recounting his teenage years and he said, back when I was a boy, we played spin the bottle. We played it this way, we spun the bottle and if it landed on you, if you were a boy, you were, then the, the girls were supposed to kiss you and if they chose to, they could give you a quarter instead of a kiss. And then he said, by the time I was 18, I had accumulated enough quarters to pay my way all the way through college. <laughs> well, the quarter's all right. But for some, it's poor compensation for a girl not wanting to kiss you, for a girl to reject you. It's hard to be rejected. It's hard to be unwanted. There was a heartbreaking story in the Associated Press that made the rounds of the world almost 10 years ago now. It was about the plight of unwanted girls in India. Let me ask you, if you could only have one child, which one would you prefer, a boy or a girl? Now most likely everybody here would say, either one, it doesn't really matter. I would love a little girl or a little boy just the same. But that's easy for us to say in our technological society. But in a poor agricultural-based society, 
where help on the farm is vital, it's believed that a male baby will, over the course of his lifetime, contribute more to the survival of the family and the household than would a girl. And that idea, and that understanding, and that approach to life has led to perhaps millions upon millions of girl fetuses being aborted in our world. This phenomenon takes place in India even still, as well as some other countries around the world, but in India this article focused on. And in India they said that there was slightly different reason as well for families wanting boys as opposed to girls. Parents favored sons because of the enormous expense of marrying off daughters. Families often went into debt and continued to go into debt, arranging marriages and paying elaborate dowries in order to have their daughters married off to some boy. A boy, on the other hand, will one day bring home a bride, and with that bride will come the dowry, the financial resources from the girl's family. So, there are many, many unwanted girls in India. The problem is so serious that hospitals were, are legally banned from revealing the gender of an unwanted fetus in order to prevent an abortion based on sex. Some female babies born are still treated with such neglect that they don't survive. Many of those who do survive are given a particular name, Nakusa or Nakushi, which in Hindi means unwanted. Can you imagine naming a child unwanted? Giving the girls the feeling and the belief in, deep inside them that they're worthless, that they're a burden, that they are literally not wanted in this life. That's why there is one district in India that has started conducting ceremonies in which these girls are able to officially erase their names and replace that name with a name of their own choosing. Is there any emotion more devastating than feeling so unwanted, so rejected, especially by those who are supposed to love you? Well, Jesus knew exactly what that was like. His own people rejected him too. One who was closest to him, one of his closest friends, betrayed him. Another one of his friends denied him. And when he needed them the most, almost all of his friends turned their backs on him. Jesus knew what it was like to have those who once showered him with praise turn their backs and reject him. And then even shout, crucify him, crucify him. All this, of course, was foretold in the Old Testament section of the Bible. This Sunday is Palm Sunday. It's intended to be a day of celebration. On this day, we remember how the people of Jerusalem welcomed Jesus with open arms into their city. You may know the story. Jesus and his disciples had been making slow but steady progress on their journey towards Jerusalem and towards the cross, although the disciples didn't understand that yet. And as they're nearing Jerusalem, approaching Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples on ahead to the village, to there at the entrance to the village, to untie the colt of a donkey and bring it to him, so that he could ride on it into Jerusalem. And if anyone asks, Jesus told those two, if anyone asks, why are you untying it? They're to say, the Lord needs it. Well, there's a bit of background here. Donkeys were valuable tools for households. And because many of the people were quite poor, donkeys were often cooperatively owned by several families. And that sort of system seemed to work very well for people. But property laws were not absolute. There was an ancient law that required any person to render to any king or any one of the king's emissaries an item or a service needed by that king. So if the king needed a donkey, they were obligated to give the donkey to the king. 
So in our story, Jesus tells his disciples to get the colt of a donkey, and if the owner asks what they're doing, simply to respond, the Lord needs it. And they did. So the disciples brought the young donkey to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt's back and put Jesus on it. And notice what comes next. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the ground before him. Again, based on an ancient custom, spreading clothing on the pathway was a way of honoring royalty. In the Old Testament, in 2 Kings chapter 9, we, we can read that when the people became aware that Jehu had been anointed king of Israel, they hurried and took their cloaks and spread them on the ground in front of the king on the bare steps. They blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king! In like manner, Luke tells us that they not only spread their cloaks down before Jesus, but people also came out, the Gospel writers say, to meet Jesus with palm branches, which is something that we customarily do in our Palm Sunday celebration. When the procession came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples, the followers, began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for everything they had seen, and now they're believing and feeling that Jesus, this new king, is coming to set them free from Roman slavery and oppression. They shout out, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But of course, all this fuss over Jesus didn't sit well with the Pharisees in the crowd. And in another gospel writer, they say to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus replied, I tell you, if they keep quiet, even these stones will shout out. You see, Jesus was receiving the welcome that he richly deserved. He had taught the kingdom of God faithfully. He had healed multitudes of people who were sick. He had performed miracle after miracle to help and benefit the community of God's people. He had set an example of living life at its very best. And now he's being welcomed into Jerusalem as king. That could have been how the story ended. But of course it was not to be that way. <clears throat> In 2007, Marcus Borg, a theologian, published a book called The Last Week, in which he tells about the last several days, the last seven days of Jesus' life before his resurrection on Easter Sunday. He tells about a parade that was occurring on the opposite side of Jerusalem, even as Jesus was entering into Jerusalem proper. Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, was entering Jerusalem on the other side. And he was at the head of a column of imperial cavalry and soldiers. Jesus' procession, Jesus at the head of it on the donkey, and the crowds of people and their, their bare feet following along into the city, Jesus is proclaiming the, the head of a, the kingdom of God. Pilate's procession proclaimed the power of the Roman Empire. Pilate was there with his soldiers in case there was trouble. And in those days, in that part of the world, the Middle East, there was always trouble, especially within Israel, within, within Palestine, where the, the people of God, the Hebrew peoples lived, at Passover, which was a festival that celebrated the Jewish people's liberation from an earlier oppressive empire, well over a millennium before. Marcus Borg writes, Imagine the imperial procession's arrival in the city, a visual panoply of imperial power, cavalry on horses, foot soldiers, leather armor, helmets, weapons, banners, golden eagles mounted on poles, sun glinting off metal and gold, the sound of marching feet, the creaking of the leather, the crinkling of the bridles of the horses, the beating of drums, seeing the swirling of the dust, the, the long procession as Pontius Pilate came in, and see the eyes of the silent people of Jerusalem looking on, some curious, some in awe, most resentful of Rome. You see, Pilate's procession displayed not only imperial Roman power, but also imperial Roman theology. According to Roman theology, the emperor was not simply the, the ruler of Rome and the whole Roman Empire, but also was the son of God. 
inscriptions referring to Augustus, who ruled the Roman Empire 20 odd years before Jesus, said that Augustus' father was the son of the Roman god Apollo, referring to him as the Son of God, the Lord and Savior, the one who had brought peace on earth, Pax Romana, Roman peace, but it was peace with an iron fist. Pilate's procession into Jerusalem embodied not only a rival social order, but also a rival theology. Pilate, on one side of the city, Jesus and his disciples on the other side. The stage is set for the inevitable clash between the mightiest kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. And when that clash reached its climax, crushed in between, the might of Rome and the will of God was the broken body of the crucified Savior, Jesus. Yes, Palm Sunday is a celebration, but it was short-lived. Very soon the innocent Jesus was being tried before the same Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. And he was being turned over to the people to be crucified, unwanted, rejected by his own people. But as we well know, that's not the end of the story. Next Sunday, next weekend, we'll be celebrating Easter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The stone rolled away, the tomb empty, the risen Christ making hundreds of appearances <clears throat> to all sorts of people. But we'll talk more about that next week. For now, content with the words of the psalmist, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day, so let us rejoice and be glad. <clears throat> Within a few short days of this parade, this first Palm Sunday parade, with the Son of God leading the procession, Within a few short days, Jesus was totally iso isolated, completely rejected, and worse. As we would normally recognize and celebrate in this upcoming Holy Week, the night before his, his crucifixion, on Monday, Thursday night, Jesus gathers with his disciples in the upper room and shares the, the last Passover that he breathed new meaning into, and it became what we call Holy Communion. At which time, one of his friends broke away and for a payment of money, the next day, betrayed Jesus on Good Friday. The day in which Jesus, isolated, rejected, and abandoned, is tortured and crucified on the cross. But, please remember, Jesus gladly experienced that, as the book of Hebrews in the New Testament says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He experienced all that, so that all of our days, all of our lives, we would remember and know that we are never alone, even in our current COVID-19 pandemic in our world. We are called the body of Christ, part of the family of God. And as such, remember, give reminders to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Remind each other that we are forever beloved children of God, with the very presence of God's Holy Spirit within each one of us. Remind one another by the old-fashioned means of phone calls, cards, letters, social media, and of course, please keep everyone each one in your prayers. And we shall rejoice and be glad all our lives until that day comes when we witness the heavenly choirs gathered around the throne of God, taking up that song sung by that first fickle crowd on that first Palm Sunday. Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Except this time, there will be no rejection. There will be no not 
being wanted. You see, the stone the builders rejected, Jesus, has become, become the cornerstone. The Lord has done it, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. Praise be to the Lord who is with us now and always. Amen. And let us join our hearts together in prayer. Wherever we are, we can pray together as we talk with God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you have made our world in beauty and wonder, and yet we see so much hurt, so much betrayal and suffering and fear that harm our world and all peoples. But we know and we trust that your love has power in all situations, even the most troubling or tragic, such as how our world is experiencing things now. Hear us, Lord as we bring to you our prayers for the peoples and places near us and all over our world. Father God, we pray for people who struggle with poverty, with sickness, with grief. Touch them in their pain. Fill them with your peace. Restore to them hope, your hope. Lord God, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. Father, we pray for people and communities burdened by the weight of war, of greed, hostility, hostility, and jealousy. We pray for peace in our world. Lift their burdens and restore their hope. Bring justice and peace to bear all over our globe. We pray, O oh God, for people who are persecuted for their race or their creed, for the truth they tell, for those who are not treated with respect or decency. Lord God, help us, the body of Christ, to stand up against discrimination. Moved by your Spirit, Father, to restore their hope and their dignity. And Father God, we pray for our world gripped by fears and panic, and now with millions of people feeling so isolated as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. We pray for government leaders to lead with your wisdom to best provide care and safety and help for people. We pray for the medical people as they care for the ill and the dying. May your compassion and protection, strength and peace be with each of the nurses, doctors, techs, custodians, PSWs, clerks, and admin people in hospitals and nursing homes. We pray too, Father, for the paramedics and firemen and police as they respond to emergencies. And Lord, we pray for all the families already touched by this virus. Those families who are grieving the death of their loved one because of this pandemic. Lord, we pray for the medical researchers around the world that they would collaborate together and find the cure, the vaccine to this virus. We pray for educators and the millions of children as they adjust to online education and learning at home. With the, the requirements to stay home, we pray for peace and patience in each one's home. We pray, Father, for the multitude of peoples no longer able to work or working with reduced hours because of this virus. And Lord, we thank you for how our Canadian government is stepping up to provide support for the peoples of Canada. We pray for the staff in stores and businesses that have been deemed essential services that interact all day long with people. We pray for the health and safety of truck drivers Delivering goods all around, Lord. Help us and all your beloved children to remember that you have not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but that you have given us your Holy Spirit of power and of love. Help us, Lord, 
to show your love and caring for the people all around us in this crisis time especially. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Even as we pray together in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. While at this point, normally in the worship service, with everybody gathered together, we would rejoice and be glad at how we can share our gifts of finances that God has blessed our lives with for the furtherance of God's kingdom here on earth. But obviously, we're not doing that. Instead, the stewardship and finance team has sent out a week ago uh, information for each of the people of Kitchener's Church as to different ways for continuing to support the ministry of, of uh, Christ Church here. Uh, one is through Canada Post, mailing your offering envelope to the church. They arrive and they will be deposited in, into the bank. Another way is through PAR, Pre-Authorized Remittance Program. And uh, we can, I've sent information about that as well. And, and we can, uh, if you're interested in that, you can contact the church or email myself, uh, either my own email address or the church or Elsie Mason, better, who is our envelope secretary. And another way that works, uh, we've set up, and the stewardship team has set up and is working, is by e-transfer. All new stuff to me in, this, in many ways, but e-transfer is, is set up and is working if you'd like to. So as we continue to worship God, remembering that he has blessed our lives in enormous ways and gifted us to give back, we give back out of love and appreciation to God with all that we can and all that we are. And we sing in thankfulness from verse 4 of When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
Dr. Hardy.